guys, welcome back to another True Crime Thursday. Today I'm going to be talking about Edmund Kemper. Uh, <laughs> Coming back strong with a serial killer, and this one is very messed up. So, isn't that nice? <laughs> Sit back, relax, and slowly lose your faith in humanity. <laughs> Let's get into it. Edmund Emil Kemper III was born in Burbank, California on December 18, 1948. He was the middle child and the only son born to Clarnell Elizabeth Kemper and Edmund Emil Kemper II. Edmund II was a World War II veteran who, after the war, tested nuclear weapons in the Pacific Proving Grounds before returning to California, where he worked as an electrician. Clarnell often complained about Edmund menial electrician job, and he later said suicide missions in wartime and the atomic bomb testings were nothing compared to living with her. That's a lovely thing to say about your wife, she sounds like a lovely woman. <laughs> and that Clarnell affected him more than 396 days and nights of fighting on the front did. Kemper was a head taller than his peers by an age four. Early on, he exhibited antisocial behavior such as cruelty to animals. At the age of 10, he buried a pet cat alive. Once it died, he dug it up, decapitated it, and mounted its head on a spike. Kemper later stated that he derived pleasure from successfully lying to his family about killing the cat. And this is at age 10, by the way. At age 13, he killed another family cat when he perceived it to be favoring his younger sister, Aelin, over him. He kept pieces of it in his closet until his mother found them. Great. Great. Cumber had a dark fantasy life. He performed rites with his younger sister's dolls and culminated in his removing of their heads and hands. And on one occasion, when his elder sister Susan teased him and asked why he did not try to kiss his teacher, he replied, if I kiss her, I'd have to kill her first. Um, he also recalled that as a young boy, he would sneak out of the house and, armed with his father's bayonet, go to his second grade teacher's house and look at her through the window. He stated in later interviews that some of his favorite games to play as a child were gas chamber and electric chair, in which he asked his younger sister to tie him up and flip an imaginary switch. He would then tumble over and writhe on the floor, pretending that he was being electrocuted by gas in inhalation or electric shock. He also had near-death experiences as a child. Once, when his elder sister tried to push him in front of a moving train, and another time when she successfully pushed him into the deep end of a swimming pool where he almost drowned. I think your older sister has some issues as well. She tried to kill you two times by drowning you and shoving you in front of a moving train. Your sister got issues, man. Kemper had a close relationship with his father and was devastated when his parents separated in 1957, causing him to be raised by his mother in Helena, Montana. He had a severely dysfunctional relationship with his mother, a neurotic, domineering alcoholic who frequently belittled, humiliated, and abused him. Cornell often made her son sleep in a locked basement because she feared that he would harm his sisters regularly mocked him for his large size, he stood at six foot four by age fifteen, derided him as a real weirdo. She also refused to show him affection out of fear that he would turn gay. And told the young Kemper that he reminded him reminded her of his father and that no woman would ever love him. Kemper later described her as a sick, angry woman, and it has been postulated that she suffered from borderline personality disorder. I'd turn into a serial killer, too, if I had a mom like that. At the age of 14, Kemper ran away from home in an attempt to reconcile with his father in Venus, California. Once there, he learned that his father had remarried and had a stepson. Kemper stayed with his father for a short while until the elder Kemper sent him to live with his paternal grandparents, who lived on a ranch in the mountains of North Fork, California. Kemper hated living in North Fork. He described his grandfather as senile and said that his grandmother was constantly emasculating him and his grandfather. 
On August 27th, 1964, at the age of 15, Kemper was sitting at the kitchen table with his grandmother, Maud, when they had an argument. Enraged, Kemper stormed off and retrieved a rifle that his grandfather had given him for hunting. He then re-entered the kitchen and fatally shot his grandmother in the head before firing more into her back. Some accounts mention that she also suffered multiple post-mortem stab wounds with a kitchen knife. When Kemper's grandfather, Edmund Emil Kemper, returned from the grocery shopping, Kemper went outside and fatally shot him in the driveway. He was unsure of what to do next, so he phoned his mother, who told him to contact the local police. Kemper called the police and waited to be taken into custody. After his arrest, Kemper said that he just wanted to see what it was like to kill Grandma, <laughs> and testified that he killed his grandfather so he wouldn't have to know his wife was dead. Psychiatrist Donald Lund, who interviewed Kemper at length during adulthood, wrote, In his way, he had avenged the rejection of both his father and his mother. Kemper's crimes were deemed incomprehensible for a 15-year-old to commit, and court psychiatrists diagnosed him as a paranoid schizophrenic. They sent him to Atacadero State Hospital, a maximum a maximum security facility that houses mentally ill convicts. At Atacastero, California, youth authority psychiatrists and social workers disagreed with the court psychiatrist um, diagnosis. Their reports say that Kemper showed no flight of ideas, no interference with thought or expression of delusions or hallucinations, and no evidence of bizarre thinking. They also observed him to be intelligent and introspective. Initial testing measured his IQ of 136, over two standard deviations above average. He was re-diagnosed with a less severe condition, a personality trait disturbance, passive-aggressive type. Later on in his time at Atacastero, Kemper was given another IQ test, which was given a higher result of 145. Have you noticed that most serial killers are really damn smart? Maybe when you get really smart, you just get really crazy. Honestly, I wouldn't be surprised. Kemper endeared his life to his psychiatrist by being a model prisoner and was trained to administer psychiatric tests to other inmates. One of his psychiatrists later said he was a very good worker, and this is not typical of a sociopath. He really took pride in his work. Kemper also became a member of the JCs while in Atacastero and said he developed some new tests and some new scales on the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, specifically an overt hostility scale during his work with the, with the psychiatrists. After his second arrest, Kemper said that being able to understand how these tests functioned allowed him to manipulate his psychiatrists and admitted that he learned a lot from the sex offenders to whom he administered tests. For example, they told him that to avoid leaving witnesses, it was best to kill a woman after raping her. Well, that's a great thing to tell someone. Thank you. On December 18th, 1969, his 21st birthday, Kemper was released on parole from Atacastero. Against the recommendations of psychiatrists at the hospital, he was released into the care of his mother. Such a horrible idea. <laughs> he had a chance. He had a chance, and you did that. By this time, his mother had remarried, taken the surname Strandberg, and then divorced again. At 609 A. Ord Street, at Post, California, a short drive from where she worked as an administrative assistant at the University of California in Santa Cruz. Kemper later demonstrated further to his psychiatrist that he was rehabilitated, and on November 29, 1972, his juvenile records were permanently expunged. The last report from his probation psychiatrist read this. If I were to see this patient without having any history available or getting any history from him, I would think that we're dealing with a very well-adjusted young man who had initiative, intelligence, and was free of any psychiatric 
illnesses. It is my opinion that he has made a very excellent response to the years of treatment and re rehabilitation, and I would see no psychiatric reason to consider him to be of any danger to himself or to any member of society. And since it may allow him more freedom as an adult to develop his potential, I would consider it reasonable to have a permanent expunction of his juvenile records. While staying with his mother, Kemper attended community college in accordance with parole requirements and had hoped he would become a police officer, though he was rejected because he was too tall. Was it too tall and too wide? I don't know. That's rude. That's sizest. At the time of his release, he was six foot nine, which led to his nickname, Big Ed. Kemper maintained relationships with Santa Cruz police officers despite his rejection to join the force and became a self-described friendly nuisance at a bar called the Jerry Room, a popular hangout for law enforcement. Kemper worked a series of menial jobs before gaining employment with the State of California Division of Highways, now known as California Department of Transportation. During this time, his relationship with his mother remained toxic and hostile, the two having frequent arguments that the neighbors could hear. Kemper later described the arguments he had with his mother around the time, stating the following, My mother and I started in on horrendous battles, just horrible battles, violent and vicious. I've never been in such a vicious verbal battle with anyone. It would go to fists with a man, but this was my mother, and I couldn't stand the thought of my mother and I doing these things. She insisted on it, and just over stupid things. I remember one roof razor was over whether I should have my teeth cleaned. When he had saved up enough money to move out with a friend in Almeida, California, there he still complained of being unable to get away from his mother because she regularly phoned him and paid him surprise visits. Woman, leave him the fuck alone. He doesn't like you. Leave him alone. He often had financial difficulties, which resulted in him frequently returning to his mother's apartment. At a Santa Cruz beach, Kemper met a student from Turlock High School to whom he became engaged in March of 1973. The engagement was broken off after Kemper's second arrest, and his fiancée's parents requested her name not to be revealed to the public. The same year that he began working for the highway division, Kemper was hit by a car while riding a motorcycle that had been recently purchased. His arm was badly injured in the crash, and he received $15,000, $90,000 today, in a civil suit he filed against the driver. As he was driving around in a 1969 Ford Galaxy he bought with his part of his settlement money, he noticed a large number of young women hitchhiking and began storing plastic bags, knives, blankets, and handcuffs in his car. He then began picking up young women and peacefully letting them go. According to Kemper, he picked up around 150 such hitchhikers before he felt homicidal sexual urges, which he called little zapples, and began acting upon them. Between May of 1972 and April of 1973, Kemper killed eight people. He would pick up female students who were hitchhiking and take them to isolated areas where he would shoot, stab, smother, or strangle them. He would then take their bodies back to his home, where he decapitated them, performed ermotio on their heads, which pretty much means he banged their dead, he their decapitated heads, like in their mouths. That's lovely, lovely thought. Had sexual intercourse with their bodies, not just their heads, and then dismembered them. Great. <laughs> During his 11th month murder spree, he killed five college students, one high school student, his mother, and his mother's friend. Kemper has stated in interviews that he often searched for victims after having arguments with his mother, and that she refused to introduce him to women attending the university where she worked. He recalled she would say, you're just like your father, you don't deserve to get to know them. I mean, he had tendencies of being a serial killer when he was young, but if he had a mother that wasn't so shitty, maybe he wouldn't have gone this far. On May 7th, 1972, Kemper was driving in Berkeley, California, when he picked up two 18-year-old hitchhiking students from Fresco State University, Mary Ann Fish and Anita Mary Luchessa. After driving for an hour, he managed to reach a secluded wooded area near Almeida, California, with which he was familiar from his work as a highway at the highway department, without alerting his passengers that he had changed directions from where they wanted to go. It was there that he handcuffed Fish and locked Luchessa in the trunk, then stabbed and strangled Fish to death, subsequently killing Luchessa in a similar manner. Kemper put both of the women's bodies in the trunk of his Ford Galaxy and returned to his apartment. He was stopped on the way by a police officer for a broken taillight, but the officer did not text the dead bodies in the car. 
Kemper's roommate was not home, so he took the bodies into his apartment where he photographed and had sex with them before dismembering them. He then put the body parts into plastic bags, which he later abandoned near Lumena Prada Mountain before disposing of priests and Luchessa's severed heads in a ravine. Kemper engaged in immersia with both of them. In August of that year, Fisch's skull was found on Loma Prida Mountain. An extensive search failed to turn up the rest of Fisch's remains or the trace of Luchessa, so that's great. Don't hitchhike. Take the bus. Call someone. Don't hitchhike. Not a good plan. You might get someone nice. You might not. <laughs> On the evening of September 14th, 1972, Kemper picked up 15-year-old dance student named Aiko Ku, who had decided to hitchhike to a dance class after missing the bus. He again drove to a remote area where he pulled a gun on Ku before accidentally locking himself out of the car. However, Ku let him back in! No! I would have figured out if there were keys in there, I would have tried driving out. I mean, he had a gun, so he could have just shot me through the window, but at least I would have had a chance. I wouldn't have let him back in the car. However, Ku let him back inside as he had previously gained the 15-year-old's trust while holding her at gunpoint. Back inside the car, he proceeded to choke her unconscious, rape her, and then kill her. Kemper subsequently packed Ku's body into the trunk of his car, went to a nearby bar to have a few drinks, then returned to his apartment. He later confessed that after exiting the bar, he opened the trunk of his car, admiring his catch like a fisherman. Back at his apartment, he had sex with the corpse, then dismembered and disposed of the remains in a similar manner as the previous two victims. Ku's mother called the police to report the disappearance of her daughter and put up hundreds of flyers asking for information, but she did not receive any responses regarding her daughter's location or status. On January 7th, 1973, Kemper, who had moved back in with his mother, was driving around the Calvario College campus when he picked up 18-year-old students Cynthia and Cindy Shaw. He drove to a wooded area and fatally shot her with a 22 caliber pistol. He then placed her body in the trunk of his car and drove to his mother's house, where he kept her body hidden in a closet in his room overnight. When his mother left for work the next morning, he had sex with the body, removed the bullet from the corpse, and then dismembered and decapitated her in his mother's bathtub. Kemper left Shaw's severed head for several days, regularly engaging in immersio with it, so he had sex with it multiple times then buried it in his mother's garden, looking up at her window. After his arrest, he stated that he did this because his mother always wanted people to look up to her. He discarded the rest of Shaw's remains by throwing them off a cliff. Over the course of the following few weeks, all except her head and right hand were discovered and pieced together like a macabre jigsaw puzzle. A pathologist determined that Shaw had been cut into pieces with a power saw. On February 5th, 1973, after a heated argument with his mother, Kemper left his house in search of possible victims. With heightened suspicion of a serial killer preying on hitchhikers in the Santa Cruz area, students were, heightened, were advised to only accept rides from cars with university stickers on them. Kemper had such a sticker, however, because his mother worked at the college. He encountered 23-year-old Rosalind Heather Thorpe and 20-year-old Alice Helen Liu on UCSC campus. According to Kemper, Thorpe entered his car, reassuring Lou to also enter. He then fatally shot Thorpe and Lou with his 22 caliber pistol and wrapped their bodies in blankets. Kemper again brought his victims back to his mother's house. This time he beheaded them in his car and carried the headless corpses into his mother's house to have sex with them. He then dismembered the bodies, removed the bullets to prevent identification, and discarded the remains the next morning. Some remains were found at Eden Canyon a week later, and more were found near Highway 1 in March. When questioned in an interview as to why he decapitated his victims, he explained the head trip fantasies were a bit like a trophy. You know, the head is where everything is at. The brain, eyes, mouth, that's the person. I remember being told as a kid, you cut off the head and the body dies. The body is nothing after the head is cut off. Well, that's not quite true. There's a lot left in the girl's body without the head. God, I hate you. On April 20th, 1973, after coming home from a party, 52-year-old Clarnell... Elizabeth Strandberg awakened her son with her arrival. While sitting in bed, reading a book, she noticed Kemper enter her room and said to him, I suppose you're going to want to sit up and talk all night. Kemper replied, no, good night. He then waited for her to fall asleep before he returned to bludgeon her with a claw hammer and slit her throat with a knife. He subsequently decapitated her, engaged in a with her head. I mean... 
I guess, but why'd you have to have sex with her head, though? That is, I mean, she was a shitty woman, but she was your mom? And I find that just very odd. <laughs> he then used her head as a dartboard. Kemper stated that he put her head on a shelf and screamed at it for an hour and threw darts at it and ultimately smashed her face in. He also cut out her tongue and larynx and put them in the garbage disposal. However, the garbage disposal could not break through the tough vocal cords and ejected the tissue back into the sink. That seemed appropriate, Kemper later said, as much as she bitched and screamed and yelled at me over the many years. Kemper then hid his mother's corpse in a closet and went to drink at a nearby bar. Upon his return, he invited his mother's best friend, 59-year-old Sarah Taylor, over to his house to have some dinner and watch a movie. When Harlot arrived, Kemper strangled her to death to create a cover story that his mother and Harlot had gone on vacation. He subsequently put Harlot's body in a closet, obscured any outward signs of disturbance, and left a note to police that read, Approximately 5.15 a.m. Saturday. No need for her to suffer anymore at the hands of this horrible, murderous butcher. It was quick, asleep, the way I wanted it. Not sloppy and incomplete, gents. Just a lack of time. I got things to do. Afterward, Kemper fled the scene. He drove nonstop to Pueblo, Colorado, taking caffeine pills to stay awake for the over 1,000 mile journey. He had three guns and hundreds of rounds of ammunition in his car and believed he was the target of an active manhunt. After not hearing any news on the radio about the murders of his mother and Hylet, when he arrived in Pueblo, he found a phone booth and called the police. He confessed to the murders of his mother and Hylet, but the police did not take him seriously and told him to call back. So a few hours later, he called back and asked for a police officer he knew personally, told him of what he did, and waited for the police to arrive. He was taken into custody for the murder of his mother and her best friend, and that's where he confessed to the other six murders. When asked in a later interview why he turned himself in, Kemper said, The original purpose was gone. It wasn't serving any physical or real emotional purpose. It was just a pure waste of time. Emotionally, I couldn't handle it much longer. Toward the end there, I started feeling the folly of the whole damn thing. And at that point of near exhaustion, near collapse, I just said to hell with it and called it all off. I mean, yeah, he was killing the women as surrogates for his mother, but now that his mother was dead, I don't know why he had to kill the best friend. I mean, yeah, think of a story, but then he never actually used that story as an excuse, so I don't know why he did that. But he also didn't decapitate or do anything to the best friend. He just strangled her to death. So, I mean, at that point he was derailing. I mean, he was drilling the whole time, but you know what I mean. Kemper was indicted on eight counts of first-degree murder on May 7th, 1973. He was assigned the chief, poli the chief public defender of Santa Cruz County, attorney Jim Jackson. Due to Kemper's explicit and detailed confession, his counsel's only option was to plead not guilty by reason of insanity to the charges. Kemper twice tried to commit suicide in custody. His trial went ahead on October 23rd, 1973. Three court-appointed psychiatrists found Kemper to be legally sane. One of the psychiatrists, Dr. Joel Fort, investigated his juvenile records and the diagnosis that he was once psychotic. Fort also interviewed Kemper, including under truth serum, and relayed to the court that Kemper had engaged in cannibalism, alleged that he sliced flesh from the legs of his victims, and consumed it in a casserole. Nevertheless, Fort determined that Kemper was fully cognizant of what he was doing, and that he enjoyed the prospect of the infamy associated with being labeled as a murderer. Kemper later recanted the confession of cannibalism. California used the McGotten standard, which held that for a defendant to establish a defense on the ground of insanity, it must be clearly proven that at the time of the committing of the act, the party accused was laboring under such a defect of reason from disease of mind and not to know the nature and quality of the act he was doing, or if he did not know it, that he did not know he was doing what was wrong. Kemper appeared to have known that the nature of his acts were wrong, and he had shown signs of malice and a an aforethought. On November 1st, Kemper took the stand. He testified that he killed the victims because he wanted them for himself, like possessions, and attempted to convince the jury that he was insane based on the reasoning that his actions could only have been committed by someone with an abhorrent mind. He said two beings inhabited his body, and that when the killer personality took over, it was like blacking out. On November 8th, 1973, the six-man, six-woman jury deliberated for five hours before declaring Kemper sane and guilty of all charges. He asked for the death penalty, requesting death by torture. However, with a momentum placed on capital punishment by the Supreme Court of California, he instead received seven years to life for each count. 
with these terms being served concurrently and was sentenced to the California Medical Facility. Kemper was incarcerated in the same prison block as other notorious criminals as Herbert Mullen and Charles Manson. Kemper showed particular disdain for Mullen, who committed his murders at the same time and in the same area as Kemper. He described Mullen as a cold-blooded killer, killing everybody he saw for no good reason. Kemper manipulated and physically intimidated Mullen. I mean, he is a big man. Mullen was five foot seven, and he's six foot nine, so I couldn't understand that. Kemper stated that Mullen had a habit of singing and bothering people who some when somebody tried to watch TV. So he threw water on him to shut him up. Then, when he was a good boy, he'd give him peanuts. He liked peanuts. That was effective because pretty soon he asked permission to sing. That's called behavior modification treatment. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Kimber remains among the general population in prison and is considered a model prisoner. He was in charge of scheduling other inmates' appointments with psychiatrists and was an accomplished craftsman of ceramic cups. He was also a prolific reader of audiobooks for the blind. In 1987, Los Angeles Times article stated that he was the coordinator of the prison's program and had personally spent over 5,000 hours narrating books with several hundred completed recordings in his name. He was retired from these positions in 2015 after he experienced a stroke and was declared medically disabled. He received his first rules violation report in 2016 for failing to provide a ur urine sample. While imprisoned, Kemper has participated in a number of interviews, including a segment in the 1982 documentary The Killing of America, as well as an appearance in the 1984 documentary Murder, No Apparent Motive. His interviews have contributed to the understanding of the mind of serial killers. FBI profile John Douglas described Kemper as among the brightest prison inmates he has ever interviewed, and capable of rare insight for a violent criminal. Kemper is forthcoming about the nature of his crimes, and has stated that he participated in the interviews to save others like himself from killing. At the end of his murder, no apparent motive interview, he said, There's somebody out there that is watching this and hasn't done that, hasn't killed people, and wants to, and rages inside and struggles with that feeling, or is so sure that they have it under control. They need to talk to somebody about it. Trust somebody enough to sit down and talk about something that isn't a crime. Thinking that way isn't a crime. Doing it isn't just a crime. It's a horrible thing. It doesn't know when to quit, and it can't be stopped easily once it starts. Kemper was first eligible for parole in 1979. He was denied parole that year, as well as the parole hearings in 80, 81, and 82. He subsequently waived his right to a hearing in 85. He was denied parole at his 1988 hearing, where he said, Society is not ready in any shape or form for me. I can't fault them for that. He was denied parole again in 91 and in 94. He then waived his right to a hearing in 97 and 2002. He attended the next hearing in 2007, where he was again denied. Prosecutor Andre Simmons said, We don't care how much of a model prisoner he is because of the enormity of his crimes. Kemper waived his right to a hearing again in 2012. He was denied parole in 2017 and is next eligible in 2024. And I have a feeling he's going to be denied again. Because of what he did, there's a low chance they're going to just be like, Okay! I mean, he's much older now. And he had a stroke. So it's less likely that he would have the strength to really kill people, but that doesn't mean he couldn't try, and they can't take that chance. So he's just going to sit there and rot like he should. To conclude, this story's messed up. <laughs> I literally hate him. I mean, his mother sucked. His dad sucked. They sucked. His grandparents sucked. His sister sucked. His whole family sucked ass. And he had signs of being a serial killer early on. But adding on the fact that his family treated him like shit probably didn't help the situation. I'm just saying. And the victims were surrogates for his mother. Because his mother sucked. So yes, I hate him. Because he killed people. I hate him a lot. Like a lot. And he killed them and he did gross things to their bodies and just... I hate you. But I also think at least killing his mother was justified. I mean, killing anyone is not a good thing. You should not kill people. No. But I can understand why he would want to kill his mother. But killing those other people? No. If he... If they were surrogates for his mother, he should have just killed his mom. If that was the point. Instead of going out and killing everyone else. Just kill your mom. Get it over with. 
instead of murdering seven other people. <laughs> I hate him. There are a few killers I hate. He's added on their list. Using your mom as a dartboard? Interesting. But having sex with their head? Mm -hmm. Having sex with any decapitated head? Mm, that's a little far. A little far. I don't think it needed to happen. But you did it. Thank you for scarring me. I hope you guys enjoyed as much as you can enjoy a story like this. I'll be back again on Thursday with another True Crime Thursday and Monday with whatever I decide to post. Alright guys. See you later. Whoa.